Coming up on MCTV this week. A slut walk puts focus on rape culture in America and children across the world are being fed by MC. This week starts now. Welcome to MCTV This Week. For Camera and Line, I'm Bronwyn File. Many students decided to take a stand and raise awareness on campus last week by walking in protest. Tori Philbin take us, takes us to the slut walk. This walk looks to highlight slut shaming and victim blaming. By the participants dressing in a quote, slutty way, the walk puts a focus on the notion that the way a person dresses or acts is a cause of them being victimized sexually. This movement looks at rape culture and how that affects the victim and their willingness to report the crime. I hope this shows the campus that there are a lot of people who aren't going to put up with slut shaming, they're not going to put up with victim blaming, and that there's a safe space for people to come and talk. The students in the Women's Studies Senior Capstone course, taught by Trudy Peterson, were the driving force behind the slut walk. We all kind of had reasons close to our hearts, I think, that we were tired of slut shaming, victim blaming, and we wanted to create that change on our campus. The slut walk has created a reason for discussion. I hope people keep talking about it. Even if they didn't necessarily agree with the slut walk, I'm glad that they're talking about it. This Tuesday, a panel discussion on the slut walk was held by the Mammoth College Coalition for Women's Awareness. This discussion was meant to educate those who are confused about the meaning of the slut walk and the terms slut shaming and victim blaming. Slut has been used to denigrate women to justify rape and violence against them. So if you say, there's nothing wrong with being a slut, yeah, I'm a slut for wearing this skirt, for having sex, for enjoying sex, for whatever, that doesn't give you the right to rape me. So by reclaiming it and saying, this is who I am, so what? It's a word that's used to discipline women to get us to act in appropriate ways. And even when we do act in appropriate ways, it's a way to get us to act even you know, more appropriate, if you will. Um, reclaiming that word means that if I'm a slut, I am a strong-willed, outspoken person who uses her body in whatever way that she chooses to use her body. Um, it is about owning my own space, and it's about owning who I am. In the midst of Sexual Harassment Awareness Month, Peterson hopes to see a change on campus. I would like more awareness of how frequently sexual harassment and assault um, happens, how often we contribute to rape culture by saying, oh, why is she wearing that? What are, you know, how women do it to other women, how men do it to women, women do it to men. How do we enforce that? So first, awareness, um, and then hopefully, strong education. If there's only one space that you are learning about sexual assault prevention and it's all about victim learning to protect themselves, that's not enough. Slut shaming, victim blaming, rape culture, and sexual harassment will continue to be important yet controversial issues among students and faculty. For MCTV, I'm Tori Philbin. The Women's Studies course has conducted a campus-wide survey on these topics. They plan to reveal their findings on Scholars Day. Last week, Monmouth students got the chance to feed starving children halfway across the world. The Latino organization known as RIACES hosted their annual Kids Against Hunger event in which they asked for donations to help pay for meals for hungry children in places like Africa and South America. Up to 35 children could be fed with a $15 donation. More Latino culture and Kids Against Hunger helps third world countries such as Africa, South America, and so here in Monmouth. And it, since it helps like a lot of countries in poverty, we know that like many Latino countries are in poverty. That's why we're trying to help out. Ray says was able to send over 2,000 meals this year. In the final Great Decisions Lecture of the Year, Dean Massoud discussed America's tumultuous relationship with Iran and whether or not their nuclear program will get off the ground. Massoud highlighted important issues such as Iran's poor relationship with Israel, their nuclear capabilities, and their prominent role in the distribution of the world's oil supply. When asked whether or not he believed that there is any good solution to the tensions between Iran and Israel, Massoud proposed a two-pronged approach that includes honesty and dipl diplomacy. And they, uh I think the best thing would be for Iran to come out clean and, and, and show to the world that it's not developing a, a nuclear uh, military component of the nuclear program. And so that would be the best solution. But it doesn't seem to me that that's going to happen in the near future. So if that's not the case, then I think diplomatic channels should be the 
first uh, option for, for the world. Stay tuned in the fall for a new lineup of Great Decisions lectures. With the end of the year soon approaching, students got in line last week to find out where they'll be living next school year. Students lined up according to the registration number they were given to sign up for which dorm they want to live in for the next academic year. Some think the process is beneficial, but others don't find it as effective. But this, you actually get to pick out the exact room that you want. You get to check out and see who your neighbors are. And you really get to set up things a lot differently um, on a personal level, which I think is really important for students, seeing that they're going to be living there for an entire academic year. You don't want to be stuck in a situation that you really don't like. I don't know how the numbers are done. I guess it's on credit. But then once they have the same credit, uh, they just do it by last name. Also, you see kids coming in who didn't go yesterday, and they just get it cut to the front of the line which is kind of like if you wait for a long time and then someone cuts in front of you and they get the house you wanted or the room, I don't believe that's fair at all. The next housing sign-up won't happen until the spring of 2014. As of right now, no expect changes are expected to be made to the process. People gathered last week to drink some coffee and talk about classics. These informal gatherings bring faculty and students from the classics department together to talk about topics related to the study of classics. This week's conversations focused on professors who are getting ready to give presentations for CAMAS, which is a national Latin organization for graduate students and people who teach Latin. They're always very impromptu. We never really have an exact date, but if uh, someone wants to give a presentation or something, we usually will schedule them for Thursdays or Friday afternoons. And um, so it's just a great time for classics majors and the faculty together and speak real informally about classic stuff. You can find more information on the Classics Department on the MC website under the Academics link. Taking a look at some events on campus this week, Crimson Mask opens their latest August Osage County in the Wells Theater this Thursday and will run through Sunday. Tickets are now available in the Stockdale Center. 2 p.m. on Sunday afternoon, relax in the Dull Chapel as the MC Chamber Orchestra plays through their spring concert. And on Monday, comedian and magician Michael Kent will take the stage in Scotland Yard at 7.30. Up next in sports, Monmouth softball plays host to Illinois College for a doubleheader with much more at heart than just a win on the field. We've got the highlights next. After dropping both Friday games to Illinois College, the Scots had one thing on their mind come Saturday, revenge. Bottom three, freshman sensation Brandon Haroon doubles to center, scoring Mitch Comstock and Nick Humphrey to give MC a 2-0 advantage. Bottom three, Nick Humphrey, this time at the plate, finds the gap in center field, scoring Andrew Baudino, and it is quickly 3-0, Scots on top. Monmouth hurler Nick Hull allowed four earned runs on ten hits, walking three on the afternoon. The sophomore cruised through five innings, but loaded the bases in the sixth. Here Josh Crumweedy connects, driving in two icy runs. Before an errant throw to third base, would ultimately score Crumweedy to tie the game at three runs apiece. Bottom nine, Scott's down to their last out, trailing 5-3 with two on for Ryan Crandall, and the junior comes up clutch, knocking this game-tying triple to deep center field, scoring Humphrey and Alex Temple. But wait a minute, 
Crandall rounds third and will score on a wild throw from the Blue Boys. Monmouth steals a victory in game one in comeback fashion, six to five. Coach said I had the green light to swing. Um, it was 2-0, uh, liked to pitch, fouled it off, 2-1. Um, I thought the guy would come back with breaking stuff. He came back with a fastball, and I just tried to put a good swing on it and uh, went from there. MC and IC would again battle down to the wire in game two. The Scots picked up in game two where they left off in game one. Catcher Jordan Gaither kept the hot bats going, knocking this double to center field, scoring Brandon Haroon, and it's 1-0 Monmouth. The visitors fought back with a run of their own in the second, a T.J. Albers solo blast put them on the board, and we're all tied up at one apiece. An IC air in the fourth put Monmouth back on top four to two, but in the fifth, with the bases jacked, Dave D'Alfonso smashes a Scott Kemple offering to straightaway center field. His grand slam gave his team the lead seven to four. In all, six unearned runs were scored in this one as each team's offense would decide the outcome. D'Alfonso was only one for four on the afternoon, but he made it count when it mattered most. Down four in the sixth, game one hero Ryan Crandall smacks an RBI single to pull MC back within two. But Crandall wasn't done there. The junior added another Scots run in the eighth inning, scoring Rayshon Fox on this sacrifice fly, pulling his team back within a single run. However, that would be the closest MC would get, dropping game two to IC, eight to seven. They get disappointed. You could see the look at her. I want to hit the grand slam. They're down. But you know, as we told them, that was only in the fourth, the top of the fifth inning. Okay, there's a lot of not even half of the game's over yet. So there's a lot of baseball left. And I knew we were going to score. Okay, so I didn't have any problem with it. You know, we could have easily tied it up a couple times. We made a couple base running mistakes. We had a couple bad at bats. You know, but uh, you know, that's the way it's been all year. The loss meant that Monmouth dropped three of four games this season against Illinois College. Now, after splitting the next series with conference foe St. Norbert, the Scots welcome non-conference opponent, the University of Chicago, to Glasgow Field. Already up two in the first, U of Chicago's Ricky Troncholiti goes deep. It's five to nothing Maroons early on. The visitors would score once more, upping the lead to six to nothing. The Scots then answered with a run of their own off the bat of Ryan Crandall. The solo shot to left center made it six to one in what would be a long afternoon for the home team. The Scots drop a tough one, 22 to four. Tough one to swallow, but it's baseball. And, and, if, and I've been in this game for 30 some years and everybody has a game like that. And it just happened to happen today. This weekend, the Scots will get their fill of arch rival Knox. On Saturday, the doubleheader in Galesburg is set to take place at noon and two. And then the doubleheader, the traveling road show comes to Monmouth on Sunday Noon and two scheduled first pitch times from Glasgow Field. On April 5th, MC Softball took on the aforementioned Prairie Fire. Early on in game one, both teams could muster only a run, but in the second, after a solo blast from Emily Woods, Summer Foster went yard, knocking in high school teammate Caitlin Winkler, giving MC a commanding four to one advantage. Monmouth would tack on three more runs, forcing the game to a fifth inning mercy rule Scots win 12-4. They're always good, so you know they never really. I don't really think anybody's ever upset about those. So uh, I'm hoping maybe we can come out and get a few more, and you know get those back that they hit on us too. Monmouth put up an impressive 17 runs in Game Two, including three homers. This one comes off the bat of catcher Charlotte Park in the second inning. Six strong innings of work from Skylar Johnson limited Knox to only two runs. MC's offense clicked all game long, 17 to three, your final score. A win's a win, so any win that we get, it feels awesome, but especially getting a win from Knox feels amazing. With the victory, MC coach John Goddard ties former softball coach Kathy Wagner with 94 wins apiece, tying them atop the list for the all-time winningest coaches in Monmouth softball history. Nearly five months have passed since MC softball lost assistant coach Jeff Fluff Terrell. Last Sunday, they honored his contributions to the game he loved. David Beidel has more. 
Today, MC Softball honors one of their own. Coach Jeff Terrell suffered a fatal heart attack last fall, and today they honor his memory. His son, Kevin Terrell, honored him with a speech before today's game. He took us through the life and legacy of who they call Fluff. He got the nickname of Fluff when he was uh, attending junior college, and he was living with his uh, brother at the time, and they had a uh, daughter named Ann that was about four years old, and every time she referred to Je my dad, um, instead of saying Jeffrey, it would say Fluffy because she was missing her two front teeth. So uh, they just happened to stick when he was 19 years old. Fluffy was uh, become legendary as far as, you know, in reference to him. A legend that always put athletes first and cared about not only Monmouth College, but the surrounding community as well. With well over 100 friends and family in attendance at the ceremony before the doubleheader, the effect Coach Terrell had on the community was displayed in full force. Remembering such a legend brought about tears and sorrow, but smiles and laughter were brought about through stories of fluff told by his son and others who had the benefit to know Coach Terrell. But uh, I will bring up one thing about hotel rooms. When you're in a uh, hotel room with a guy for two years, you learn a lot of things about him. Uh, the ceremony the highlighted many stories about Fluff that ranged from fishing with his son in Galconda and always leaving the bathroom light on in a hotel room to never charging for a pitching lesson. The resounding legacy that Fluff leaves here at Monmouth College is one of persistence and a love for softball. Somebody that's, uh, you know, committed to the to the program and the athletes more than anything. Um, you know, he would tell you a hundred times that he's not the he's not the best pitching coach out there. He wasn't the the best strategist or the best position coach in general. But he loved the game, and it was really for him to be successful. He needed the players to know how much he cares before how much he knows. With so many ways the MC softball team has come up with to honor Fluff this season, their most important is to do something he would have wanted them to do, is to win. I mean, the whole day was dedicated to him, so that's the reason why we're out here. Everything we do, every, every time we step on the field, everything we do is for him. Uh, hopefully just keep winning. That would be nice. Um, we still continue to wear the Fluff sweatbands and the bracelets. Um, we wear the shirts every home game or game that's normally away. Um, just to try to, we incorporate them in our cheers and our MCSB. So, I mean, basically, we're just trying to have them with us every game that we can. For every Fighting Scott softball player, Fluff left behind his lessons he taught them so that they could pass them on to future generations. They've dedicated this season to the memory of Fluff. Right now, they're playing very well um, in his memory. Um, they'll take away those that actually had um, his knowledge and, and his coaching um, will have knowledge that they can use it with their children whenever the time comes or if they go into coaching they can pass that knowledge on to um, their players. You know I want to thank Mom with College and, uh, for allowing us to have this day and honor him and what he did. Like I say once again you know he, he He's pretty special to me, but I'm pretty biased. But all in all, you know, when you, you look at all the things that are going on in, in today's society, um, you know, to, to make this happen and honor somebody that just cared about student athletes um, and loved the game of softball or just coaching in general, um, it's, a, it's a big honor. And I, I want to thank everybody that helped make this happen today. This afternoon's contest against the Lady Blues of Illinois College means much more than just the outcome of the game. This fall, Monmouth College Fighting Scots softball program lost a kindred spirit, but the memory of Coach Jeff Terrell lives on. For MCTV Sports, I'm David Beidel. When the ceremony concluded, the Scots faced off against Illinois College. Playing inspired ball, Monmouth wasted no time jumping out to an early 1-0 advantage in the first inning when Charlotte Park grounded out, scoring teammate Macy Gilbert. IC took back the lead after a two-run blast in the top of the second Bottom two, a Summer Foster walk with the bases loaded, scored Courtney Bennett, putting Scots on top once more. Pinch runner Caitlin Carter would score on a fielder's choice to regain the lead for MC before an RBI double by Emily Watkins pushed the Scots ahead. They finished the inning, capitalizing on a Blue Boys air, sending the lead to 5-2. From there on, hurler Alyssa Edler held IC scoreless and the Scots win 6-2. Game two of the twin bill was a different story, despite a hot start from MC. Summer Foster led off the game with her fourth home run of the season, 
Her team's 17th overall, setting a new single season team record in only 19 games. Bottom two, tied at one, it's Foster again, finding the gap in left center, driving home Kelsey Barnes to give MC a 2-1 advantage. But the Lady Blues were determined to avoid the sweep. Paige Cullison hammers this Skyler Johnson offering to center field over the fence. IC back on top, 6-4. To Unfortunately, the Scots couldn't muster any more offense in this one, and they fall to Illinois College, 7-4. to four. Uh, We've got to tighten up our defense, um, get our hitting shoes back on. But main thing right now is tighten up our defense, eliminate some of the errors at critical times. In the game. In desperate need of a conference victory, Monmouth men's tennis hosted Illinois College last Saturday. Monmouth scored a trio of wins in their doubles matches. The number one doubles team of David Stewart and David Johnson, as well as the number two squad of brothers Chris and Marco Franco, each rolled to 8-1 victories. Alex King and Andrew Shea Callis also dominated, blanking Sheldon Null and Matt Newman 8-0. I put more balls in play and get the points rolling a little more. We struggle with three turns sometimes in big matches, and if we can get that figured out, then we can take the W in the big matches. In singles play, Monmouth got victories at the top of their lineup. Number one, David Johnson blanked Colin Ladd 6-0, and then won the second set 6-2. David Stewart was victorious 6-0, 6-1, and freshman Marco Franco shut out Anthony Samples in straight sets 6-0, 6-0, MC walked away with a much-needed victory. Next week, you know, our biggest match of the year is coming up Thursday next week against Cornell. So we, we really have to really focus on improving our singles games. We've been playing very good doubles all year, but we got to really focus in on our singles game uh, over this next week. So This weekend, a pair of conference matches await the Fighting Scots. They'll host Knox at 9 a.m. Saturday, and then later Saturday afternoon, they'll host Grinnell at 1 p.m. That's been a look at sports. Here are your scores for this week. Welcome back. Mama's own a cappella group performed on April 5th. The Scotsmen performed a set of over 10 songs to the audience of students, staff, and faculty. For four years, I knew the guys that started the, the group, and it's just, it's all fun for me. It's not really work. If you're looking for more music on campus, next Friday at 7.30 in the Dahl Chapel, MC's chorale, concert, and chamber choirs will be performing. The most recent coffeehouse event brought some relaxation to campus. ASAP held a coffeehouse event last Thursday featuring the cello group Tall Heights. Cello group Tall Heights played on Thursday, April 4th in the underground while student, students were treated to ice cream and coffee. It's beneficial to give students a break from homework and allow them to um, relax and have a great time. ASAP's next event will be magician and comedian Michael Kent on Founders Day Eve. Gospel music rang throughout the Dahl Chapel last Friday night. The Hoppers are a widely known gospel music group who performed on campus as part of the Maple Leaf Community Concert Series. The group has been singing together for more than 20 years, and its member Connie Hopper was recently inducted into the Southern Gospel Music Hall of Fame. This family band has performed shows all around the world, including a concert in Dallas, Texas, where they sang in front of 40,000 people. For more information on the Hoppers, you can visit them at their website, thehoppers.com. That's it for MCTV this week. I'm Kyle McEwen. And I'm Bronwyn File. Tune in next week for a new edition of MCTV. And I'm Cameron Line. Remember that you can find us on the web 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at monmouthcollege.edu slash MCTV. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.